Hey everybody, um, you'll see I'm sitting in the chair, that's because I'm the oldest member allegedly of the committee, that gives me the pleasure, no com comments by the way, they do let me out at night still, so don't worry about that. Um, so because of, of, I'm the oldest member then I chair the, the, the meeting for the first two items on the agenda. Can I welcome everybody to the meeting, uh, the first meeting of the Jobs and Fair Work Committee. Can I say to members that if they turn all mobile devices off, it interferes with the broadcasting, so I'd be grateful if you do that. Uh, there are no uh, apologies received, so we go straight into ag agenda item n uh, number one. That's the declaration of interest. My intention is to move to the left clockwise and then come round the table if you make your declaration. And if I start by saying that I own a business, I am a part owner, I should say, of a business called Gills Motor Factors. It's now run uh, by my son, uh, Glenn. We distribute throughout Scotland to the motor trade, so there is a, a prospect that some of the business that we may do, there, there, there may, it may be related. So I'm, I'm declaring in that, in that regard. I, I also am a board member of an a UK-wide organisation called NIBS. It, it's set up as a, a, a company that deals with all businesses involved in the business that I'm in. I, I don't take any pay or expenses. I, meet, I, I go to a meeting once a year. I'm also, because through the family business, I, I'm a member of the National Federation of Small Businesses. I've never attended any meetings, but very much a supporter of it. And anything else that I, I don't think anything in my declaration of interest uh, should be noted today, but if anyone's interested, it's there in the public domain for everybody to see. Okay, thank you. Can I move to the left, please? Okay. Yeah, I, I've got nothing to declare, but on a voluntary basis, I'd like to just highlight that I've been working for the last few years with the Scottish Grocers Federation to highlight the impact of the convenience store sector uh, on the Scottish economy. Uh, I don't receive any remuneration for doing so, but I think it's important to um, promote the work of the Scottish Grocers Federation. Hi, I'm currently a director of uh, my own company, Spontaneous Production, which has currently been wound up since I got elected. Um, and it was uh, dealing in oil and gas uh, training programs and video production work, but it's currently been wound up. Uh, I have nothing to declare. Oh, uh, good morning. Um, professionally, uh, by background, I'm a lawyer, so I'm a member of the Law Society of England and Wales. Um, I was previously a partner of uh, the law firm Linklaters, which is a law firm based in London, uh, from which I retired uh, as of 30, 30th of uh, April, and I have no longer any connections with that firm. I do not have any other um, outside uh, commitments. In terms of share ownership, I own approximately 4% of a private limited company registered in England which is involved in the private energy sector, primarily in relation to energy uh, metering systems. This company has no business interests in Scotland and uh, has no intention of having any uh, business involvement in Scotland. I have no control or directorships in this company. I am merely a, a minority shareholder. In terms of heritable property, I own residential property in Scotland, both uh, as an occupier and in the past also as a landlord. In terms of investments, uh, as part of my personal pension plan started in 1996, I have funds under management by Equitable Life, in respect of which I have no discretion in terms of the management or allocation of those funds, uh, which uh, uh, will appear on the Register of Interests. Uh, I have no decision-making capacity with regard to how those investments are made. Thank you. Um, no shareholdings or pecuniary interests. Um, I uh, voluntarily um, uh, offer, though, that I am a member of the GMB Trade Union, uh, Unite the Union, uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland and the Cooperative Party. 
Thank you. Uh, so I am a director and 100% shareholder in my own business, Trinity Care Limited, uh, which is a company that provides legal advice services uh, in my capacity as a lawyer. And on that note, I am a member also of the Law Society of England and Wales and the Law Society of Scotland, and I am a landlord uh, for a property in Edinburgh. No interest to declare. Um, I'm an unremunerated director of Strathleave and Regeneration Company, and I am also a member of GMB and Unison. Uh, I am a self-employed advocate and member of the Faculty of Advocates. Uh, I also own heritable, pro heritable property in Edinburgh and West Lothian and uh, receive rentals from these. These are domestic properties. I hold ordinary shares in the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, further detail of that will be in the Register of Interests. Uh, I have no relevant interest to declare. Uh, voluntarily, I am a Chartered Accountant, member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. Okay, thanks very much for that, everyone. Can I take you to item number two, and that's choice of convener. The Parliament has agreed that not only members of the Scottish uh, Conservative and Unionist Party are eligible for nomination as convener of this committee. I understand that Gordon uh, Lindhurst is the party net nominee for that post. So, therefore, do we agree to choose Gordon Lindhurst as our convener? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you very much for that. And, Gordon, can I invite you to take the chair? And I also wish you luck for the future. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. May we move then to item three on the agenda, which is choice of deputy convener. Uh, my understanding is that John Mason is the Scottish National Party's nominee for that post. Do we agree to have John Mason as our deputy convener? Uh, I would congratulate John Mason on his election as deputy convener. And then... <laughs> And then move on to item four, which is to discuss and agree the committee's approach to work programming and also the suggestion of holding what is termed a business planning day, I think away day possibly is the <coughs> technical term used by some for this. You will all have seen paper number three in the papers provided to the committee members. Uh, do we wish to hold a business planning day as suggested in the paper number three prepared by the clerks to the committee? Gordon MacDonald? Um, just to say that I'm on the holiday from the 18th of August. I think the clerks of the committee will liaise with individual members to try and establish what date is suitable for everyone. And in light of what Gordon has just said and others, it may be that it will have to be um, either earlier or uh, in August or possibly early September. But we'll, we'll ask the clerks of the committee to liaise with members and establish a suitable date for everyone. So are we agreed to do that then? If I could move on then to the question of what we will discuss for the business of the committee in the uh, coming session. You will all have seen the, the legacy paper from the previous committee and the suggestion is that this be considered at the business planning day as to the items in it or whether we wish to use this as a basis for the committee's further work. And I take it there's no difficulty with that. Um, Jackie Bailey? Um, no, I think it's an eminently sensible suggestion, but I wonder whether there's the opportunity for members to reflect um, in advance of a business planning day on other topics that we would wish to have considered as well. I don't think we should be constrained solely by the legacy paper, or, although I think it's a very helpful foundation to start with. Yes, I think, are we all agreed with that? Um, John Mason? Thanks. Sorry, Deputy I mean, Convener. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, can I just clarify, because obviously if we didn't have the, the away date till quite late on, 
um, we still need to be working on things at the beginning of September. So do we need to decide sooner rather than later what kind of things we might look at in September? Yes. Well, basis. Um, one of the inquiries we carried out, uh, I'm the only member that was on the previous economy committee, and one of the inquiries we carried out the last time was about internationalisation of um, Scottish business. And when we looked at um, the situation with Chamber of Commerce, UKTI, um, SDI, etc., it was a very um, cumbersome and mixed picture. And I think to give us breathing space to identify what the set the other um, topics we could look at later in the year, um, in the legacy paper under 59.60.61, it makes a proposal that we could look at the remit of Scottish Enterprise in high, um, and that might be a good starter. It's, it's apolitical, so it gives us an opportunity to get our teeth into a subject. Um, it's also something that uh, Audit Scotland is going to be releasing a report on during the summer, and uh, I believe the government's doing a bit of um, uh, looking at this subject as well. So it might be something to start to start off with, bearing in mind John's point about, you know, if we have the planning meeting late, we still have to be up and running for the beginning of September. So it's only a suggestion, but, you know, it's a topic from the, the uh, legacy paper. Thank you, Gordon. I think that's something we could note, the clerks could note and possibly bring back to the next meeting in two weeks' time, and we could further discuss it then. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Dean Lockhart. Yes. Um just in terms of uh, logistics, um, I'm very keen for us to have a constructive dialogue. As Gordon said, there's a, a lot of work to be done with regard to the Scottish economy. Um, should we set up, uh, for example, a distribution list um, in terms of emails so that we can share policy ideas? Because I think the Scottish economy really does need uh, some new, fresh impetus and ideas uh, in terms of how we tackle uh, unemployment, in terms of how, how we tackle the lagging uh, uh, GDP of Scotland. So can I just put, put on record, um, uh, convener, that um, it would be good to have, um, and maybe that's in place already, uh, a distribution list where we share policy ideas because uh, while we're in recess or in chamber, we won't always necessarily be in this room sharing ideas, but I think it's uh, if we all have the same agenda, which I think we do, of taking the Scottish economy forward and bringing a, a, a stronger Scottish economy for the benefit of the Scottish people, then I think that uh, it would be good to actually, for, for this f uh, f uh, format to be quite informal and to be also dynamic in terms of bringing policy, new policies forward. We need new policies. That's clear. Thank you, Gord. Thank you, convener. Well, I think what the clerks can do is just compile an email distribution list in the first instance, which can be shared with the members of the committee, and then we can see how we take that forward. I mean, if people wish to approach things on that basis. Uh, we could also further discuss that at the next meeting if anything arises from that. The, are there any other points on the particular issue of the legacy paper that people wish to uh, point out or draw particular attention to so that people can consider this prior to the meeting in two weeks' time where we will discuss the legacy paper and how that fits into the business planning day. I mean, I suppose if you want ideas as to other things I think we should focus on, uh, I mean, I'm very keen we focus on the living wage, uh, fair work, I think the whole question of manufacturing as part of the Scottish economy, uh, and certainly social enterprise has been mentioned before. Right, that's noted. Yes, go on. Um, just before the election, we actually looked at living wage and fair work in quite a bit of detail. And while I'm 
not adverse to, to looking at the subject again. It might be too soon to look at it so quickly after we looked at it last session. Um, secondly, um, if we want to look at, as Dean suggested, um, some way of growing our economy quickly, it might be an idea to look at the situation of our airports. Um, we're in a situation where Edinburgh is growing, and I think it's hit 11 million uh, passengers recently. And we could replicate the situation that <coughs> Dublin has, where um, people to and from America um, can go through immigration in Dublin. And that has a fantastic input. Um, it draws, I mean, Dublin has a huge number of flights that go through um, in that airport now, and it has a knock-on effect on trade and tourism. And it might be another subject worthy of, of uh, discussion and look at, looking at. All right, that's, that's noted. And I think Andy Whiteman. Thanks, convener. <coughs> I'm just wondering if it's worth um, reaching out to those outside Parliament in the trades unions and business to invite them to suggest topics or questions they have that might merit the committee's attention. That may be something that you want to look at, perhaps, to bring to the committee? Uh, and <coughs> no, it's a suggestion that the committee itself may wish to reach out to, to people beyond Parliament um, to invite any suggestions they have about agenda items for the future of this committee, not in the immediate term, yes. possibly. All right, we'll, we'll note that as well. Uh, Richard Leonard? Uh, yeah, just to agree with Andy Whiteman's suggestion, I think um, Gordon will keep us right, but ha has it not been the case in the past when there have been away days, sometimes external speakers have been invited in to stimulate a discussion? So there are... The one thing that I, I think works really well, and we only started doing it in the second half of this term in any great um, detail, was having the away days. Um, we had one in Paisley, and we, when we were looking at fair work from memory, and we invited um, unemployed people, small businesses, and um, agencies that help people into work. And it was informal. That my, my concern about how the parliaments work, we're developing professional witnesses. So sometimes it doesn't matter what the topic is a committee's looking at, it's always the same witness that turns up. And um, you know, I, I'd be happier if there was more informal sessions where um, we actually heard from the front line, if you like, about what's really happening, rather than being filtered through some lobbying organisation. Um, yes. so, suggesting having people, uh, not necessarily, I mean, a mix of witnesses, as it were. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but it's, it's not that you have a speaker. It's a case of, it's an, you know, how I've done it before is one MSP sits with um, a group and you maybe have six or seven groups and you, you act as a facilitator or another just to keep the conversation going. And you usually get a clerk or somebody who's taking uh, notes um, so that we've got some form of feedback um, from those discussions. And I, I think they work particularly well. We've also had round tables in um, the coffee lounge. It was the main one. We invited a lot of, this was the one when I was on ICI committee and uh, we invited a lot of small businesses and again they all came it was an, an evening session and they all came and it was good to hear that first-hand information about a potential can't remember the piece of legislation now but the piece of legislation that was going through parliament and we got a bit of feedback so again i thought that always these things work better that way yes, in my may, view anyway. it may be helpful to have that sort of thing although one has to be careful not to have um, too much simply anecdotal evidence yeah, and also absolutely. informality. It's a the balance question of, between the two. Indeed, yes, yeah, the question of how um, views expressed or comments made are recorded and also how the people are selected yeah. to, to come to such informal sessions because one can have professional witnesses on one side and on the other hand have people with a particular issue that they simply wish to promote. And of course that's important to have regard to these people but also have a balance, as, as you say. So far, discussions we've had <coughs> in these informal meetings, and of which I've done three now, um, there has been no individual that's came along to these meetings with a particular axe to grind. It's about moving the agenda forward, and it, it's worked well. 
that doesn't to, that doesn't mean that it wouldn't happen, but you know, so far, touch wood, it's it's not happened. I think Jackie Bailey wanted to make a it, comment, and then Dean Locker. Um, it, 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 the moment has passed, but nevertheless, um, I do think what would be helpful for our away day is to distinguish between those subjects that maybe lead, lend themselves to one or two evidence sessions and those that are subject of much wider inquiries, um, because I think we will want to mix and match a bit as we as we go along. Um, I would support you know looking at Scottish Enterprise Skills Development Scotland. The government is doing that, being aware of their timetable and being able to influence that, I think, would be helpful. Um, and I would be remiss if we didn't mention oil and gas, given what's been going on over the past week and indeed over the past few months. Um, so I don't know what um, the committee has done, where it left off, but that's something I think we should return to from time to time. Right. Dean Lockhart, or has your moment passed? Uh, my moment never passes. Thank you, convener. Um, that was irony. Uh, no, we in case, not. in case, sorry, in case anyone, <laughs> in case it escaped anyone. Uh, look, I, I, I would all just say that uh, I think our duty as a committee is to anticipate changes to the economy, and uh, look ahead and uh, plan for a you know changes in technology, changes in business practices which are already taking place. Uh, for example, the digital economy. Um, we, I think Scotland actually has a, a, a very strong position in the digital, digital economy and that's something we can leverage on and I'm very keen that we bring, if we do discuss and bring external speakers in, uh, people from the digital economy would be very valuable to, uh, to, 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 that, to that exercise. Also, I mentioned in the Chamber last week uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, I know it sounds a bit outlandish, but um, I, I spoke to someone uh, yesterday, and that is something that is some, that's something we'll have to deal with. Uh, Edinburgh employs thousands of people in the back office of uh, financial services that uh, those jobs might be at risk of uh, being overtaken by new software systems that will be in place in, in the next two years' time. So I think the, the convener, the, the point I'm making here is that um, we have to look ahead. This is a this is a five-year term, and we have to look. You know, the not, not not deal with last year's problems. We have to we have to deal with the challenges we're going to face in five years' time. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Julian Martin. Just coming off the back of what Dean's saying, I think what I'd like to look at something that I mentioned in one of the speeches I've done recently is about remote working, and um, more people actually, particularly in areas that aren't urban. So in the rural economy and looking at remote working and supporting those who aren't getting in their cars and going into an urban environment to work in an office and facilitating, helping people facilitate and growing businesses that can work remotely. Good. Um, yes. I mean, maybe the Clarkson will be able to guide us the line between us and the Rural Economy Committee, which I happen to be on as well, because I get very confused sometimes as to where one starts and another stops. Well, I'll, I'll take one more point from Andy Whiteman and then perhaps we can move on to uh, the next uh, part of the discussion because a lot of this we're starting to get into detail that obviously we can work out uh, as we move forward. Andy. Uh, yes, just briefly for the next committee meeting, I think the outcome of the European referendum should be on the agenda. <coughs> Well, I think the European Union referendum is something that is really um, Westminster's remit, not, well, not the Scottish Parliament's. So, sorry, not the Scottish Parliament's remit. And I'm not certain if on the 28th of June we will have any um, clear position as to what relevance it may be to this committee. The referendum only having taken place four or five days before. You know, um, you know, yes, we're, Gordon. We're, we're talking about a situation that could have a massive impact, whatever way it falls in our, eco in our economy. And for you to turn around and say that it's not something that should be considered by this committee seems to me a wee bit um, 
disingenuous to say the least. Well, I think if we do invite the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy to come, and if he considers that, he, he may well have comments to make on it and how that may impact on Scotland. So it may be that um, that is something that will arise. I mean, if, if well, it depends what way it goes, whether or not it will have a huge impact. Yes, Jackie Bailey. Um, I, I agree with the convener's suggestion. I think that's a neat way of dealing with it if the Cabinet Secretary is coming. I wonder, though, whether we couldn't commission Spice to do just a short paper um, capturing some of the facts emerging, insofar as we're able to, um, that might inform committee members, if it's possible. Well, what we'll do is the um, Cabinet Secretary, I think, is everyone content that he should come to the next meeting to outline what the government's proposals are or what the, the sort of programme going forward from the government's point of view is? <coughs> if he considers the European Union referendum, depending on the outcome, obviously, he may take one view or the other, whether or not it's something that he needs to go into at the meeting. Uh, we will allow him to take up that issue if he considers it appropriate, depending on the outcome. We will also ask for SPICE to um, provide a report insofar as they, they think they can uh, five days, I think, or for our meeting, which is four or five days after the referendum. Is everyone happy with that approach? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. So, so it would be the, the Cabinet Secretary for the Economy and also the Minister, uh, I think that's Paul Wheelhouse as well, the two of them uh, would be invited to come to the next meeting. The clerks of the committee will get in touch with regard to timing because obviously that may have to be uh, set to a certain extent around the, the cabinet secretary and the minister's commitments on that particular day. So unless there's anything else, which I don't think there is uh, from the convener's point of view, we'll uh, adjourn. We'll not adjourn, we'll close this meeting of the committee. Thank you to everyone for coming and look forward to working with you over the next five years.